Welcome back to the AR-15 Barrel Series. Today, we'll be looking at a 14.5 inch piston driven barrel assembly from LMT that was provided to the channel by Roy at Weapon Outfitters. Roy has been a big help to the channel and has supplied a lot of materials for these videos, so I really appreciate the support he's been able to provide. I actually ended up being able to look at three different examples of this barrel, which means that there's a lot to go over. We'll start by looking at the specs. The barrel is 14.5 inches, made from chrome molly vanadium steel, has a 5.56 NATO chamber, 1 to 7 twist, and it's chrome lined and cryogenically treated for long term durability. And we'll also get into a few differences between the three barrels that I ended up handling. The first two looked normal without anything out of the ordinary, and then the last one that I received had an extractor reinforcement nub in the barrel extension, which I believe is designed to increase reliability with extraction. And as a quick side note, the HK416 and MR556 barrels have a similar protrusion in the barrel extension that is part of HK's over the beach suite of upgrades. There are also a few other rifles that I believe have this extractor reinforcement, including the Caracal 816, SIG 516, MCX, and probably a couple others. The third LMT barrel that I received also had an additional cut in the feed ramps. This is supposed to help with feeding of pointier bullets. Due to the black finish and also the lighting, it's a little bit difficult to see. So here's a 12 inch LMT barrel that has the same feed ramp cut. In this lighting, it shows up a little bit better. Anyway, next up, we'll move on to the inspection. We'll start with the weight, and the barrel assembly weighs about 2.4 pounds. Next, we'll move to the bench for some gauging, starting with the throat erosion gauge, and there weren't any surprises here. Examples 1 and 2 measured a 2 on the throat gauge, and example 3 measured a bit tighter at a 1. Next is a chamber of dimensions gauge. This checks to make sure that the chamber is at least minimum size, which is important for general function and ammunition compatibility. And all examples pass. Next, we'll check the headspace with a new stripped JP Volt and Forster headspace gauges, starting with a minimum headspace gauge, and all examples pass. Next is a 223 no go gauge, and the bolt is able to close on all these barrels, meaning that the headspace is larger than this gauge. So we'll move on to a 223 field gauge. Barrels 1 and 3 failed this gauge, and the bolt can also close on barrel 2, but it requires a little bit more force. So I'll let you debate in the comments if that's a pass or a fail. Either way, the headspace on these barrels are all pretty loose. And last, here's a 5.56 max headspace gauge. I didn't have this gauge when I had a barrel 1, so I wasn't able to test that barrel with it, but barrels 2 and 3 both pass the max headspace gauge. And this means that the barrels all technically fall within the serviceable headspace range. However, they are all surprisingly close to the max headspace. And because of that, they might fail the max gauge and have to be pulled from service a lot sooner than they would have if the headspace started out a bit tighter. Anyway, here's a chart with all the gauging results that I've had for all the barrels I've done so far. And the LMTs are the only ones that have failed the field gauge. So this is part of the reason why I ended up going through three different LMT barrels. Moving on to the barrel extension diameter. Since LMT uppers have a clamp design, this measurement probably isn't really that important, but still pretty interesting to see the differences here. And here's a chart that shows the minimum clearance that the barrels would have with an upper receiver. And it's pretty interesting to see the LMTs at the top, bottom, and the middle of this chart. Not a whole lot of consistency there with the LMTs. Also, a quick note about example 3, it was not able to slide in or out of the upper receiver that I was using unless I heated the upper. I know that some people find heat fit uppers for AR-15s is desirable, but since LMTs use a clamp to secure the barrel anyway, I'm not really sure that the addition of a heat fit would be any better. Also, needing heat to install and remove the barrel kind of ruins the quick change feature, I would think. But anyway, we'll keep moving on. Next up, I'll use my test long bore scope to take a peek at the inside of these barrels, starting with the body of the chamber. And barrels 1 and 2 have some vertical impressions in the chamber, which is kind of interesting. These aren't very deep and didn't leave any marks on the brass, so I don't think that these are a problem or anything, but just interesting to see. And here's a comparison between barrels 2 and 3. You can see that barrel 3 doesn't have those same longitudinal impressions. It does have some radial tool marks, so it looks like the barrel 3 was manufactured a little bit differently than barrels 1 and 2. Here's a look at the throats of barrels 1 and 2, and they both look pretty good. The start of the throat looks pretty even, and I don't see any obvious defects. And then here's barrel number 3. Again, the throat looks to be pretty even. However, the throat has these huge abrasion marks. So this barrel came directly from LMT, and I took the bore scope footage right after I took it out of the package. And the bore scope was the first thing that I put down the bore. Here's a better look at the abrasion after I cleaned it up a bit. You can see that the part that has the abrasion on it has a little bit different color to it. So I'm pretty sure this happened after the barrel was chromed. And it looks to have eroded some of the chrome away in those spots. So I believe this difference in color is from the base metal that's supposed to be underneath the chrome. And the abrasion appears to extend past the throat a little bit and into some of the rifling lands. This is my first time seeing something like this, so I'm not really sure what happened here. But not exactly what I was expecting to see in a brand new barrel. 
Also, after I shot the barrel, there were a few spots that were in line with the abrasion that had some carbon that was pretty well stuck to it, and it was particularly difficult to remove. I was eventually able to clean it all off, but those spots took quite a bit more effort than the rest of the barrel. Moving on to the rifling, here's a look at barrel 1 as I received it. The rifling looks fine. The chrome, however, has some issues. There's a fair amount of chrome flaking in the barrel, but I thought that some of this might have been debris. So here's another look at barrel 1 after I cleaned it and the chrome looks to be flaking quite extensively. I did end up shooting this barrel, and unsurprisingly, the flaking got a bit worse after shooting. Here's a look at a different part of the barrel. The chrome looks to have a little bit of a texture to it. It's pretty faint, but to me, it kind of looks like a dried lake bed with a bunch of tiny little cracks. Moving on to barrel two, here's a look at the barrel as I received it directly from LMT before I cleaned it. The bore scope was, again, the first thing that I put down the bore, and it looks like more of the same, a bunch of chrome flaking. Here's some pictures after I cleaned up the barrel a little bit to make sure that what I saw wasn't just debris. I didn't end up shooting this barrel, I just sent this one back to LMT as is. And here's barrel 3, and there was no chrome flaking on this barrel, so we're off to a good start here. But there are some light scratches, or something that's diagonal to the rifling. I'm not sure if this is from honing or something else, but certainly interesting to see. And just to be clear, I'm not saying that these diagonal marks shouldn't be there, or that they're going to cause a problem but I just haven't seen something like this before. Here's a straight view down the bore of barrel 3, and of course you can see the rifling, but you can also see a light secondary swirl pattern from the scratches, or whatever they are. Again, not sure what that's from, but it's distinctly different from barrels 1 and 2. Here's a look at the gas ports. The chrome looks to be chipped a little bit from barrels 1 and 2, but looks pretty clean on barrel 3. And here we are looking at the crown of barrel 1. The rifling lands looks to have been deformed a little bit, probably when they put this barrel in a lathe. This sort of deformation isn't too uncommon to see. It's not a good thing or something I want to see, but apparently it happens kind of often. Moving on to barrel two, the machining on the crown looks pretty similar, but there are some obvious chrome issues with this one. There's some kind of light speckling that looks like the chrome is starting to fail, and of course some larger spots where the chrome is already flicked away. Barrel three has a little bit of deformation on the rifling lands near the crown. There are some horizontal ridges. You can see the light reflecting off them a little bit differently as we spin around here. The machining on the crown looks pretty good though. The leading edge looks pretty clean without any rough spots from the cut, but the crown looks to have been deformed a little bit after it was cut. All right, next up, I'll explain the communications that I had with LMT about these barrels. After I inspected barrel one, which failed the 223 field gauge and had chrome flaking, I contacted LMT on April 17th to see if these issues fell within their quality standards or if it might qualify for a warranty service or replacement. LMT contacted me back the following day with a shipping label. Before I sent it back, I did end up taking this barrel to the range and shooting one group with it, which we'll see a little bit later. I shipped the barrel back to LMT after that. I then received the barrel number two, which I inspected, and I again contacted LMT on May 5th to notify them that this barrel had the same chrome flicking issue as the first barrel. LMT again supplied the shipping label for me to return the barrel, and I dropped it off to UPS on May 7th. I didn't feel like wasting any time or ammo shooting barrel two, so I sent the barrel back without shooting it. A few weeks later, on May 22nd, I reached out to LMT to see if they had an estimated timeline, and they replied that they were waiting on a new batch of barrels, but didn't have an estimate as to when they would get in. After not hearing anything for a few months, I sent an email on September 3rd asking if they had an estimated timeline, and they replied that the new barrels were in and would be shipping soon. I received barrel number 3 on September 10th, which is about 4 months after I shipped back barrel number 2. After seeing the abrasion and the throat of barrel number 3, which probably removed some of the chrome, I feel like this barrel should be warrantied as well, but I chose not to contact LMT about this one. Mostly because I've been trying to get this video done since April, so I just wanted to shoot it and move on. And speaking of which, I'll go over the shooting setup, and then we'll see how everything turned out. Regarding barrel break-in, LMT does not list a barrel break-in procedure that I could find in their manual or on their website, so no barrel break-in was performed. The barrels were installed into an LMT MRP-L upper receiver, with screws torqued to 140 inch pounds. To increase rifle stability, the handguard was fitted with a three inch front bag rider and the stock was supported by a rear bag. An A5 buffer system was used with an A5-2 buffer and Sprintco green spring. The factory installed muzzle devices were left in place. Due to the five months between shooting barrels one and three, there were some differences in the shooting setup. Barrel one used a Vortex Viper 6.5 to 20 by 44 and a Geisley Super Dynamic Enhanced Trigger. Barrel three Use a DNT Optics 7 to 35 by 56 with an AR Gold trigger. Torque was checked on both scopes. A Garmin 0C1 Pro chronograph was used to collect velocity data. A Mantis X10 Elite as well as an SG Pulse were mounted to the handguard to keep track of rifle stability. 
and detect any possible shooter-induced flyers. Groups were measured using the Ballistic X app. Each group is 30 shots fired consecutively over about four minutes. This simulates a match or practical type scenario where the barrel will get some heat into it and also gives us a decent sample size to work with. Between each group, I used a chamber chiller and leaf blower for cooldown. Distance was 100 yards. Point of aim was a small circle at the bottom of the target. Point of impact was set a few inches higher to preserve the aiming point. Wind was monitored with a ribbon. Each 30 shot group took about four minutes to shoot and was edited down to about 15 seconds. For barrel one, I shot one group with IMI Razor Core 77 grain. And for barrel three, I shot three groups. First was IMI Razor Core, then Federal Gold Medal 77 grain Serum Match King. And last was KMC X Tech 62 grain M855. All right, let's see how this goes. Okay, so starting things off with IMI Razor Core. Again, this is the only group that I shot with example one. I didn't feel the need to waste any more time or ammo with that barrel, since it has some obvious defects. The shooting felt fine on my end with both barrels. Both barrels were ejecting brass forward. Despite that, neither one felt particularly overgassed. Going from memory, example one felt like it had a bit more recoil than example three, but these barrels were shot five months apart. So I might be misremembering that. But as best as I can recall, the shooting experience from example one was a bit worse than expected for a 14.5 inch mid-length barrel, and the shooting experience for example three was a little bit better. Anyway, the electronics worked well, picking up data on every shot. So we will finish up the groups and then take a closer look. Before going over the numbers, I just want to take a quick second to thank everyone that subscribed to the channel. I really appreciate the continued support. Every like, comment, and subscription helps the channel grow, which allows me to get access to more resources, create more content, and invest in better equipment to capture even better data. And for those of you who haven't subscribed yet, now is a great time to do so. I've already got several more barrels, uppers, and rifles evaluated, and I just need to find the time to edit all of those videos. So there is a lot more content on the way that you won't want to miss. And the best way to stay up to date is to subscribe to my channel right here on YouTube. So again, thanks to everyone who's already part of the community. I really appreciate you helping me keep this going. And there's a lot more coming soon. And with that, we'll get back to it. All right, so here's all my velocity data for IMI Razor Core, sorted by barrel length. The two LMT barrels ended up shooting different lots of the IMI. It would have been nice to shoot the same lot, but these two barrels were shot five months apart, so this was the best that I could do. Anyway, here are things narrowed down to just 14.5 inch barrels, and the two LMTs had very similar velocities, with example one having an average muzzle velocity of 2,540 feet per second, and example three at 2,546 feet per second. And both the LMTs were quite a bit slower than the rest of the barrels that I have chrono data with for the IMI Razor Core. Moving on to the velocity standard deviations I've recorded from IMI, I've had SDs as low as 14 feet per second and as high as 27 feet per second. LMT example one had a velocity SD on the high end at 24 feet per second, and LMT example three was a bit better with a velocity SD of 19 feet per second. Looking at the individual velocity and rifle stability data, nothing looks to be out of place for either barrel. And then looking at the groups, the group for example one looks a bit sporadic, which I guess shouldn't be too surprising given what the bore looked like. And then the group for example three looks very respectable. It's a little bit wider than it is tall, and shot 10 is a bit lonely out there on the lower left side, but overall, a pretty solid group. Before we go over the group stats, we'll go over my AZ score for the new folks. AZ stands for A Zone Equivalence Distance, and it gives you the maximum distance where the calculated group size will still fit into a USPSA A Zone. The reason why I use this score is because it's easier for me to make sense of the group numbers instead of looking at the raw mean radius numbers. Anyway, Example 1 ended up with a 30 shot group size of 4.103 MOA and a 30 shot mean radius of 0.822 MOA, which gives us an AZ score of 172 yards. And Example 3 did quite a bit better with a 30 shot group size of 1.995 MOA and a 30 shot mean radius of 0.529 MOA, which gives us an AZ score of 267 yards. And if you want some more conventional numbers to look at, if we take the 30 shot group, and break it down into three 10 shot groups. Example one got worse the more I shot it, with shots one to 10 forming a 2.6 MOA group, and then shots 11 to 20 got a 2.8 MOA group, and then shots 21 to 30 went into a 4.1 MOA group, giving us an average 10 shot group size of 3.2 MOA. And then example three did the exact opposite, with shots 21 to 30 forming the best 10 shot group at 1.2 MOA, and the average 10 shot group size for example three was 1.4 MOA. And here's a look at the leaderboard for IMI Razor Core. I've tried to keep things as consistent as I can between the different barrels that I've shot, given the time and budget that I have to work with. So things aren't perfectly controlled, but I'm doing the best with what I have. Also, I am not a perfect shooter, so all these groups could probably be at least a little bit better. 
And of course, this is all with a limited sample size. Anyway, example three, tied with the previous best for this ammo, matching the proof barrel. Both had an AZ score of 267 yards, and that was closely followed by another chrome line barrel, the Noveski, which is only one yard behind at 266 yards. Example one struggled a bit, coming in 18th place out of the 20 groups, but it still did a little bit better than the 12 inch LMT barrel that I did a video on previously. The 12 inch didn't have any chrome flaking, but it looked to have that same dry lake bed texture in the chrome. So I was a little bit suspicious of that chrome as well. But again, the 12 inch didn't have any actual flaking. It might have just shot that way. Anyway, let's move on to the next group. Okay, second group is with the Federal Gold Medal, 77 Grain Stream Match King. I like to include a premium load like this in the videos to get a sense of how well I can shoot these barrels with some premium grade ammo. And this stuff seems like a pretty decent standard to go with. Although, it is loaded at a little bit lower velocity compared to some other 77 grain loads. Anyway, shooting felt fine again on my end. I don't feel like I shot better or worse than I normally do. Wind was pretty calm for this group. Both the Garmin and Mantis picked up data for every shot. The shooting experience felt pretty good for this load as well. This Federal Gold Medal load tends to shoot a little bit softer since it's loaded a little bit lighter. But anyway, we will finish up the group and then take a closer look. Here's all my velocity data for the Federal Gold Medal. There are a few different lots in here. And here is just the 14.5 inch barrels. Again, the LMT was a bit slower compared to the BRT and Hodge barrels, but faster than the BCMs. The velocity SDs I've seen from Federal have been a bit of a mixed bag, ranging from a pretty solid 11 feet per second to a pretty poor 34 feet per second. And the LMT is kind of in the middle with a velocity SD of 20 feet per second. Looking at the velocity data, it looks like the velocity started fast and then about halfway through the string, they started to slow down. So that's kind of strange. Shot 9 was the fastest of the group by a decent amount, with a velocity that was 48 feet per second faster than average. Rifle stability looked fine with an average of 99.6. And looking at the group, it's a bit taller than it is wide, and shot 10 wandered off a bit, but all in all, a pretty solid looking group for a piston driven chrome line barrel. 30 shot group size ended up at 2.033 MOA, with a 30 shot mean radius of 0.466 MOA, which gives us an AZ score of 303 yards. And if you break the group down into three 10 shot groups, the best 10 shot group was 1.1 MOA, and the average 10 shot group size was 1.4 MOA. Moving on to the leaderboard, I have 20 groups that I shot with the Federal Gold Medal, and the LMT 14.5 inch piston comes in ninth place out of all these groups. And if you narrow things down to just duty or combat oriented barrels made from 4150, the LMT comes in a pretty close third. So a pretty solid performance. Next up, we'll see how it does with some cheaper FMJ ammo. All right, last group is with PMC M855. I like to include an FMJ load with these videos because I usually end up shooting at least a decent amount of FMJ through my ARs. So seeing how barrels do with different tiers of ammo seems like helpful information to me. Anyway, shooting felt fine again on my end. Brass continued ejecting forward with this group. The shooting experience felt fine though. Bolt carrier velocity and recoil felt within normal expectations. Wind was calm. The Mantis and Garmin picked up all the shots. And yeah, nothing out of the ordinary with this group. So we will finish up and then take a closer look. All right, so I don't have any comparison data that I can show you guys yet, but the LMT ended up with an average velocity of 2,807 feet per second, and the standard deviation came in at 21 feet per second, which I think is pretty decent for an FMJ load. Nothing looks too out of the ordinary with the velocities, and the rifle stability looked fine. Looking over at the group, it's about three inches tall and just under two inches wide, but looks to be pretty decent for M855. 30 shot group size ended up at 3.020 MOA, and the 30 shot mean radius was 0.746 MOA, which gives us an AZ score of 186 yards. Breaking things down into 10 shot groups, things were pretty consistent, with the best 10 shot group being 2.1 MOA, and the worst 10 shot group being 2.5 MOA, giving us an average 10 shot group size of 2.3 MOA. As I'm sure you can imagine, this experience didn't exactly go as planned. I guess it took about six months or so to get this all done. And even then, I ended up with a barrel that has a weird abrasion mark on it and some chrome missing. But it shot pretty decent, so I guess that's something. Anyway, I'd like to say another thank you to Roy at Weapon Outfitters for helping me out with this video. And make sure that you're subscribed, because Roy hooked me up with some other stuff that I'll be making some more videos on. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Later.